So uh, we're at that point in Judges. Remember, Judges is a, a series of times over a 400-year period. It covers a span of 400 years. And in that time, there were seven cycles of, of the Jews being close to God, and then starting to drift off into the neighboring the pagan religions, and then worshiping those pagan religions, getting separated from God and leaving him behind. And then God, they're his people. He gets jealous. He judges them. He brings the neighbors uh, to judge them. He used surrounding tribes to do that. They would repent, return back to the Lord, and things would be cozy for a while. Well, that went on seven times in this 400-year period. And this is a time when Abimelech has just killed his 70 brothers. And then he, storming a tower where all the people were gathered, a woman threw a, a, a small millstone off the, off the tower and hit him in the head, and, and he was killed by that. And uh, he, remember he asked his, uh, I remember who it was, his sword bearer, to run him through with the sword so the rumor wouldn't go out that he'd been killed by a woman. You know, after all, he's a warrior. Well, it got documented in God's word, so we'll always know that. So, so we're going to see in chapter 10 uh, of Judges, two more uh, minor judges, more oppression. Uh, and uh, what is it that brings oppression and troubles with the Jews? Well, their own sin, their own failure and unwillingness to stay close to God. He's a jealous God. <clears throat> so, first one. And after Abimelech, there arose to defend Israel Tola, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo. I'd you like that for a dad's name, or like your name. Son of Dodo, a man of Issachar. And he dwelt in Shamir in Mount Ephraim. And he judged Israel twenty and three years, and died, and was buried in Shamir. And after him arose Jair, a Gileadite, and judged Israel twenty and two years. And he had 30 sons that rode on 30 ass colts, and they had 30 cities, which are called Havoth Jair unto this day, which are in the land of Gilead. When Jair died and was buried in Camon. So two minor judges, Tola and Jair, the seventh judges, Tola. The word Tola means scarlet worm. I don't know what that means other than that, it's scarlet worm. Not, we don't know much about him. Not much said about him, except he's a descendant of Issachar. Jacob and Leah had sons, and one of the fifth son born was Issachar. And he was born 550 years earlier than this, than we're talking about here. And uh, his uh, his reign at this point in time was relatively short. He didn't, uh, uh, well, for a Jewish king, for a Jewish leader, it wasn't too bad, 23 years. But this eighth, eighth judge is called Jair, probably from Jair, the son of Manasseh. And Jair's time was about the same as told us, 22 years. But uh, he's, he's, he's called by some of the commentators the judge with an attitude. I mean, he had 30 sons, not one wife. Uh, that's a lot for one wife. But he had 30 sons, he had many wives, and they rode on 30 donkeys. They headed up 30 towns. Uh, had many wives, obviously, and he was a man of wealth. He was a man of prestige. He was, you know, a man flexing his muscles. He didn't take the title king, but he sure acted like he was one. And verse 6 says, And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and saved, served Balaam and Ashtaroth and the gods of Syria and the gods of Zidon and the gods of Moab, and the gods of the children of Ammon, and the gods of the Philistines, and forsook the Lord, and served not him. It's, isn't it interesting that you get a lot of different tribes about, and they, have, they look around the universe, and they look around at one another, and they come up with these ideas of what a god is. But uh, we see that here's Israel with all these neighboring tribes uh, around them, not Jews, and they continue in this cycle that they've been in for so long, and they're continuing it, uh, up falling away from the Lord. It's called apostasy. They're apostate and falling into sin, falling away from God. This is the sixth time in that uh, that uh, four hundred year cycle. And what happens? God judges them. He brings them into bondage. He brings them into servitude. And uh, then, then of course, the, that 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 
cycle is they realize what they've done. They come before the Lord. They repent of the Lord. They pray. They, they bow down. It's called supplication. And uh, we see a familiar phrase repeated. The children uh, uh, of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. Again. They keep doing it and keep doing it. But that's our nature. That's our fallen nature to again fall away from the Lord to, to sin. It says that all sin and come short of the glory of God. It doesn't mean we're in perpetual, constant sin. We shouldn't have a sinful lifestyle. But, you know, Jesus said if we even think the wrong thing, we're in sin. And uh, it's important to remember that any time we do the wrong thing, we, you know, we call it sin, call it evil, call it whatever you want, the, the Jews in the, that day or us today, whenever that's done, God always sees it. He always knows it. In fact, he knows it before we get there and do it. He he knows it ahead of time. He knows everything. There's nothing you can hide from God. I remember grand, telling the grandkids when they're real little, you know, they run into the closet and say, you can't even hide from God in there. Put a blanket over, blanket over your head. You can't hide from God there. He sees you. He sees everything. But Israel had a uh, a sin that they kept falling back into, serving other gods. And they named a whole bunch of them. There were seven different gods that were mentioned here. You know, might wonder, well, why would they serve a certain god? Well, this god Baal, he, he's the, he was the god of financial success. And, and if you're looking for a god that will give you something, then he's kind of like having a, a, a god who's a, who's a puppet that you can pull the strings off it. And if, for those who were looking for financial success, they would worship Baal, hoping that that would come to them. Asheroth, that's uh, the goddess of uh, uh, love and sex and romance. And, uh, uh, you know, that's uh, always been the heart of man. But interestingly, uh, I have a list of the rest of the gods. Rimon in, from Syria, Baal and Ashtoreth in Zidon, Chemosh in Moab, Moloch in Ammon, and Dagon in, uh, of the Philistines. So here they know the true and the living God. He's revealed himself to be their God. He's revealed them to be his people. And yet they take the worship of Jehovah God and set that aside so that they might worship the gods of the neighbors just in case that might bring them some kind of a success and some endeavor that, that their God wouldn't fulfill. But we have this essentially wholesale idolatry. It's almost like cafeteria idolatry all around them. Everywhere you turn, what kind of a God do you want today? But rather than going against that and saying, no, we have a God. We know who God is. We, he's already shown us who he is. He's shown us that we're his people. We need to just stay with him. Kind of go with the flow. That was the, that was the catchphrase in the 60s. You know, just go with the flow. Don't resist. Just go along with it. Do what everybody else is doing. That's Kind of like, call, what do we call that, mob rule? <laughs> it's, uh, but when we follow what the rest of the world is, then we, we can't be leading people into righteousness. We can't be leading people into who God is. And frankly, you know, the world, we're, we're, the, we're the ones who claim we know God, that we have God living in our heart, and that we're going to live eternally, that our God died for our sins and stretched out his arms on a cross and we really look foolish when we start running after all these fads and all these gods of the rest of the world and letting the world influence the agenda of the Bible, of the Christian church, really. We just heard about uh, that uh, a church that gave in to uh, letting gay couples adopt children because it would affect their ability to do business. I mean, it's a tough position to be in, but... It says that uh, the article by Al Mohler said that they 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 flint they pivoted. I'm sorry, they pivoted. They were standing face on into the Word of God, holding to the Word of God, and they got put under pressure and they pivoted away from, away from the Word of God. We need to be careful. We don't do that. We know who who the Word of God is. We have His Word here. We've got all 66 books of it. We don't need to know more. I'd like to know more of what's in here. It was at Mark Twain that says, it's not the things in the Bible I don't understand that bother me, it's the things that I do understand. <laughs> he should have been bothered. I don't know that he was saved. But uh, the most important we thing we can do as believers is simply accept who God is, to know who God is, read the Word of God, and stick to the Word of God. His message, his message is eternal. It's new every morning. 
His mercies are new every morning. His, his word is fresh. It's alive. It's always up to date. Well, it was written 4,000 years ago, 6,000 years ago in some cases. It's true. They're even finding, they just found uh, some more, uh, some Greek manuscripts. Uh, actually, they were crumpled up papers of, uh, what's it, the book of Ezekiel, I think it was. I just saw on the internet. But it doesn't matter how old and crumpled the paper is. It, it, the word of God is always alive. It's always relevant because the heart of man hasn't changed and God never changes. But think, as I listed out those gods, they all had different pagan foundations to all of them. None of them were the true and the living God. But here are all these gods that Israel <coughs> would, <coughs> pardon me, would serve over these years. When they knew the true and the living God, they're willing to serve anybody, it seems, than the true God. And when people believe, don't believe in God, it's not that they believe nothing. It's the problem is that they'll start to believe anything. That's the, the danger of uh, leaving the truth of the word of God is not that you believe nothing, but you'll start to believe any old thing that people tell. That's the problem. We even look at most of the... Most of today, people talk about him being spiritual. I just heard about a warning that was coming out from people taking pilgrimages to India for for spiritual enlightenment and running into some very dangerous situations over there because spiritual doesn't mean godly. It means spirits. It can mean part of the spirit world, but it doesn't necessarily mean godly. India is a, a pagan nation. They're Hindu. They believe in reincarnation. They, and the Bible says that it's appointed once for man to die and then the judgment. Reincarnation says, oh, no, you just die and you come back somebody else or some other animal, some other creature. Don't worry about dying. We think we need to. Word of God says that we should. But uh, So there's reincarnation. Many believe in that. Yeah, I hear references on the radio about, oh, in one of my past lives. No, there are no past lives. I heard somebody talking the other on somewhere, I don't remember where it was, about, uh, you know, there's this big holding place of souls, and they spring out and they go and they enter bodies. So I'm not sure how God does that, but it's not that way. But so reincarnation is one of the ways people think about it, even today in this world. And the other is the blackout idea. You know, when you die, the lights go out. That's it. You're born have a little bit of trouble, you die, and it's all over. Boy, not a lot of hope there, is there? And what's interesting is that God has put in our hearts hope. You know, we say, oh, I hope there's more. Well, <laughs> this, is, this is a hope not based on something that we don't understand. This is, the Bible has a hope that's based on knowledge in God's Word so that we can hope in something that's real. And then there's the uh, worship of the creation. Not the Creator. You know, the, the sun and the moon and the stars. What was that group? Earth, wind, and fire. You know, worship the earth and the wind and the fire. Or, you know, you can worship the creation. You can worship animals. I, I don't... I, I, I realize we're not to mistreat animals, but you don't put animals up to and above the, uh, of the uh, value of humans. We're made in God's image. You'll hear things about, oh, Mother Earth, Mother Earth. <laughs> Make me gag. Come on, stop it. Not Mother Earth. Not Mother Earth. It's God's creation. It's Earth. It's called Gaia sometimes. It's as if it's a living, breathing form. They'll talk about Earth having its own life. Well, there are, there are living things on it, but it's just a chunk of rock. People worship the environment. They worship anything except the true and the living God. And the, it's, it's nothing uh, that the in, uh, Israelites didn't understand. Same thing. Many today will worship self. I mean, self, that's a four-letter word. They tell you to avoid four-letter words. Well, self's a four-letter word. We can worship self. Worship the intellect. It's just like Satan told Adam and Eve, you can become his gods. In fact, wasn't it Shirley MacLaine? It's years ago. She uh, uh, had a movie called Out on a Limb. We called it Out on a Broken Limb. She was on but she was standing on the beach saying, I am God. And God's saying, no, you're not. No, you're not. You're really not. All we have to go do is go back to Satan's words in Genesis chapter 3, verse 5. For God does know that in the day that you eat thereof, of the apple, that is, of the tree, that your eyes shall be opened and you shall be as gods, 
knowing good and evil. I think, you know what, I think there's something hidden in here. I think Adam and Eve knew good. They knew God. They knew the environment around them was great. It was a great place to live. I think they were about to be exposed to evil. That was what came in. Sin and death came. But uh, one of the common beliefs today is that all roads lead to God. Oh, he died, he's, she died. They're in a better place now. Maybe. Maybe not, according to the Word of God. Many of us say, well, you know, if I, I just want to be good enough. If I can do enough good deeds and just be good enough. Can we? No, we can't. We can't, we need to, we can't be saved by doing good stuff. We need a Savior. We need Jesus. Jesus said, I'm the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. That's not any fence. That's not a, 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 a wishy-washy, oh, all roads lead to God idea. Paul, under the influence of the Holy Spirit in Titus, <clears throat> pardon me, chapter 3, verse 5 says, not by works of righteousness, which you have done, or which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Not by any, and that is, the Bible's clear. It's not by our good deeds. We can't do enough good deeds to earn our way to heaven. Remember the iron lung? <laughs> what about those people? How many good deeds can they do? Well, anyway, it's, it's faith in Jesus Christ alone. Verse 7 through 9. The anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hands of the Philistines, into the hands of the children of Ammon. And that year they vexed and oppressed the children of Israel. Eighteen years all the children of Israel that were on the other side Jordan in the land of the Amorites, which is in Gilead. Moreover, the children of Ammon passed over Jordan to fight against Judah, to fight also against Judah and against Benjamin and against the house of Ephraim, so that Israel was sore distressed. So Israel, in their own rebellious hearts, wants to serve other gods. They're around. There's a lot to pick and choose from if you want to be a cafeteria believer. And what does God do? He allows them to. You sure you want to go in that direction? I'll allow you to. But it's a cost that comes to it. He puts them into servitude to the Philistines, to the Amorites. It's not, it turns out not to be a blessing for Israel. Because we'll never be blessed serving other gods. God says, I'm a jealous God. I'll have no other gods before me. The reason is that he knows that we need him. We need our, his guidance. So instead of Israel getting all these benefits that come from these special pagan gods that are around them, they end up being harassed and oppressed and distressed, it says. All the time that God's giving them what they thought they wanted, what they said they wanted, and sometimes the worst thing we, that can happen to us is to get what we want. <laughs> it's true of toddlers, isn't it? The two and the three-year-olds give them anything they want. But we're just bigger toddlers, that's all. We, are in, we can become in bondage to that which we serve. It's so important to serve the true and the living God because there's a cost for disobedience. He loves us too much to let us wander. He wants us close to him. He wants us listening to him. He wants us obeying him. Verse 10, And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, saying, How we have sinned against thee, both because we have forsaken our God and have also served Balaam. And the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Did not I deliver you from the Egyptians? Remember, that was the trip through the Red Sea, right? And from the Amorites, and from the children of Ammon, and from the Philistines? The Zidonians also, and the Amalekites, and the Maonites did oppress you. And you cried to me, and I delivered you out of their hand. Yet you have forsaken me. And you served other gods. Wherefore, I will deliver you no more. Oh, Go and cry unto the gods which you have chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. Oh, When we turn... Our back on God, when we turn from God, we turn to something. We turn to something else. And here the children of Israel, they're in trouble again. And the reason? Well, they say what the reason is. They said, we've sinned. We've sinned. Why would we sin? Why do we sin? I mean, the Bible tells us about sin. It tells us that it's pleasurable for a season in Hebrews 11. But Satan doesn't just let us wander around here doing what we want. He's here tempting us too. I'm not sure how he talks to us or coaxes us or, or tempts us, but he does. 
And the fact is, we're, none of us are perfect. We're all imperfect, and we miss the mark of perfection that Jesus had. But we don't have to be perfect in our own self. We worship and give our lives and our faith to the one who is perfect, Jesus Christ. Because sin has a cost. What is the cost of sin? There's, well, there's always a price to pay. Proverbs 13, 15 says, the way of the transgressor is hard. Okay, so when we're making mistakes, life gets hard. Is there more to it than that? Well, there's an ultimate consequence for sin. It says the wages of sin is death. That's in Romans 6, 23. There is a physical death, but there will also be a spiritual death. Eternal separation from God. That's a death we none of us want to face. Ezekiel 18 in verse 4 says, The soul that sins shall surely die. Well, we all sin, and we will surely die. And our sin will be seen. It will be discovered. It will be uncovered. Uh, Numbers 32, 23 says, You can be sure your sins will find you out. We can't hide from God. He knew from before the foundation of the world every move we'd make. We can't do that. And many people think that God okays sin because he doesn't judge us right away. And you do a parable sin and wait for that lightning bolt to come down out of heaven and <sighs> missed me this time. Guess he doesn't care. People think God, because God hasn't judged me yet for that mistake, well, not a mistake, is the thing I did, uh, then he must not really care. Well, he cares, but he's merciful. God is so merciful. I mean, look at how Israel had sinned. They'd forsaken their God, it says. They'd worshipped other gods openly. <clears throat> God, the Father, he knew that Israel needed him in their life. And he knows that there's a place for him in our life. He knows that. He knows that we will all worship and serve something or someone. Today, m millions of people openly worship Satan. They have satanic churches. There was a guy named Aleister Crowley for years that was the head of the church. I don't know where he is nowadays. I know he, where, where he is if he's not on this earth. But that leads to animal sacrifice and then to drinking of the blood of that sacrifice. Then it can lead to human sacrifice and eating the flesh of, of uh, animals and people. And you might think, why all that? Satan wants to defile us. We're made in God's image. Animals aren't. They don't have that body, soul, spirit like we do. He wants to defile mankind by doing defiling things because he hates us because we are made in God's image and he isn't. And Israelites had this dangerous pattern they kept going through was to forsake God, then they would serve other gods, and then to get oppressed by their enemies, and they call back at God on help. And they say, hey, it worked a half a dozen times so far. I mean, <laughs> let's try it again. But when they do it this way, they're not seeking God because they loved him. They were seeking God for the benefits package. They wanted to avoid the punishment. God, we're tired of this punishment. We're sinful. We sinned. Help. You think about how the United States now benefits from our early founders, our fathers, those brave men that went to war to save our nation, who sought and fought this nation and founded this nation under God. It's harder to find now, doesn't it? It can still be found in the churches, in the houses, many, in, in some places in government. But in many ways, the United States government in many places is taking God out of our society out of our natural life in order to save, serve the gods of self and flesh and money and power and influence. When we forsake God, we forsake the blessings that he has for his servants. We're his servants. It's important we keep our heart right to him. We're gardeners. We love to garden. We don't plant corn if we're going to grow cucumbers. You can't sow to the flesh if you expect to be blessed by the Lord. It grows the wrong crop, okay? If this happened to Israel... All these years ago, that was uh, about 1,100 years, say 3,100 years ago. If that happened to them, what's the next step for our nation? We call ourselves a nation of God. Should we expect to be oppressed in a way that we're oppressed by another nation? China, for example, in the trades. Should, be a, we, should we be afraid of this one world order, this global government? Look at what God said to Israel. He said, I helped you in the past. I delivered you out of Egypt. I gave you a victory over all your enemies. But you forsook me again. I'm, he says, I'm through with your forsaking me. 
not going to deliver you out of it anymore. Israel cried out to the Lord, but he didn't deliver them. Why was he so harsh with Israel? Again, God punishes not to punish, but to draw us to him, to bring out true repentance. But they had to be sick of their sin, not just sick of the punishment, before they could truly turn to God. Many people, quote unquote, cry out to the Lord, only hoping the punishment will go away. God wants our hearts. He wants our hearts turned towards him. He wants us to worship him from our heart. I mean, it's, it's easy to sing songs and then raise our hands, but he wants the heart to be part of it here. A heart that knows and understands and is willing to worship no one else but the true and the living God. So Israel looks like they went too far. Can people go too far? Can we go too far rejecting God's invitation to fellowship and love and all? Is there a time when God will no longer deal with us, with me, with you? Is there a time when his spirit will no longer strive with us? Well, yes. Actually, go way back to Genesis chapter 6. The Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. 120 years. Yes, in Romans chapter 1, verse 28, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. This is turning away from God. God gave them over to a reprobate heart, a reprobate mind, to do those things which are not convenient, not appropriate, not convenient to worshiping God. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetous, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, uh, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, see if this sounds anything like where we are, where we've always been, <laughs> without natural affection, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. How? Without that knowledge of the Lord. There's no wonder that, that there's a, a huge amount of psycho, psychiatric drugs being pumped out <clears throat> Pardon me, on people of all ages in our nation. Um, I can't think of the website. I just got some literature the other day. I was on the website, and they were giving listing out all the psychiatric drugs that are going from our children from four years old and on. Millions, millions. Without the Lord, there's no comfort here on this earth. We don't understand why we're here. Why are we here? We're, we're here to know him, to serve him, and to tell others about him. When we don't do that, we're a creature that's not doing what we're intended to. But without the Lord, there's no comfort in life or in, in death. There's no hope in death. But we can't forsake God forever and still expect to go to heaven and expect to have a memorial service or a funeral saying, oh, he's in a better place now. Maybe so. And if God doesn't respond to our need, our situation can seem homeless, hopeless. And the children of Israel knew that these other gods couldn't help them. God says, you, you want to worship these other gods? Go to them. See what they can do for you. They knew better. 15 and 16. And the children of Israel said to the Lord, We have sinned. Do thou unto us whatsoever seemeth good unto thee. Deliver us only, we pray thee, this day. And they put away the strange gods from among them and served the Lord, and his soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. Or the misery of Israel. Often our prayer is to do what seems best for me. <laughs> we have our own idea of how we want our prayer to turn out. It's always for our benefit. But what did they do? They threw... Basically, they threw themselves on his, on his mercy. <clears throat> We're guilty. We've sinned. Do to us whatever you want. That's a hard place to come to. Well, but they had no other alternative. He said, those are the gods you, you, you want. Go to them. See what they can do for you. They knew they had no alternative. There was nobody else to help them. Is that a bad place to be? That can be a good place to be if you know where to turn to. So what did they need to do? They need to put away these strange gods. So they did. They began to serve the Lord, which they should have done. So they did. 
And God saw what they were doing. He had mercy on them. Because God is a God of mercy to those who love him. But remember, he's also a God of justice to those who forsake him. Who don't accept his plan of salvation through Christ on the cross. This repentance that comes from the heart of the Israelites at this time gets mercy from God. Israel is finally at a place, again, of total surrender to God. It's easy to say, to mouth those words, I'm sorry. You apologize to your brother. I'm sorry. You know? <laughs> I remember as a kid. We can say, I'm sorry, and not really mean it. God knows. Israel is truly sorry in their hearts, not just with the words that are coming out of their mouth. Israel discovered all that they need to discover that the worst of times serving God are better than the best of times serving idols and false gods. Because when Israel repents, God does have mercy on them. And he begins to raise up a deliverer. Verse 17 and 18, let's finish the chapter here. Then the children of Ammon were gathered together and encamped in Gilead. And the children of Israel assembled themselves together and encamped in Mizpah. And the people and princes of Gilead said one to another, What man is he that will begin to fight against the children of Ammon? He shall be head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. So Israel is assembled together here for battle with no general to lead them, no commander to lead them. Now God can... He can do the work sovereignly. He's done this often enough and delivered them out of tight spots. He could just send one angel and wipe out a whole army of hundreds of thousands. But God's pattern is often to raise up a man that he could use to this end. And uh, he's hoping to encourage someone to take this command to go before them to battle promising him to be a judge over all the tribes on this side of uh, the Jordan. And remember again, we'll see next chapter, uh, save that for next week, come back for chapter 11. It's Remember, it's better to serve God in the worst of times than it is to serve the world in the best of times. And next week we'll get together and we'll meet that next man that God raises up. I'll give you a hint, his name is Jephthah. So, Lord, thank you for this time that we've had together, Lord, and uh, thank you for the, your word. Lord, I pray for this time of prayer, Lord, that we gather and uh, put before you, Lord, those needs that we have, Lord, and help us to stay faithful to you, Lord, <clears throat> that we not turn to other gods. And I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.